on X Hunt. Ever heard of it? Next time you see that guy at your local shop who always punches his tag on a stud whitetail, ask him. He'll tell you about the most trusted source for mapping. With nationwide landowner names, private and public land boundaries, including walk-in areas, map tools to mark spots, and the ability to view your maps without cell service. And that's just scratching the surface. It's your time to be known as the big buck guy around town. Download the leader in hunt mapping on Google Play or the App Store on X Hunt. Know where you stay. This week, we got a really cool uh, guest to join us because one of the things that is trending in the outdoor world and has been for the last couple of years, I think, is eating of that wild game. People like to know where their food is coming from. People like to go out and, and hunt for it themselves or catch it for themselves, but they don't always know how to prepare it. So uh, Hank Shaw is uh, our guest now. He's got a new book, uh, Hook, Line, and Supper, that is available now. We'll get it on camera there. There we go. And Hank joins us here on the show. Hank Shaw, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Very good. Thanks for uh, thanks for giving us some time today. I appreciate that. I know it's been a busy summer for you. You've been touring around the country with the release of this new book. How has that book tour been going for you? It's been going okay. I mean, in this sort of weird... 2021 which is only slightly less weird than 2020 <laughs> yeah. um and then now with delta things are just i mean that's a huge monkey wrench and everything i was all full speed ahead and this is gonna be great and the fall is gonna be awesome and then delta so who knows it's a, there's a lot of question marks at this point but uh so far so good minnesota has been really fun um i did i just got back from there and had a couple of really really good events and then a, another good event in fargo as well hmm. Where were you in? You were in Minneapolis. I was days? at Fulton Brewing. Yeah, I like how you go to the breweries. That's not that's like a perfect <laughs> fit. Well, yeah, you know, like I do like the the fancier dinners once in a while, but because it really gets a chance to showcase some some of the possibilities that you can do with each of the cookbooks. But you know, sometimes those are expensive, and I want everybody to be able to to come to an event and you know, chew the fat and drink a beer and get a book signed and, and something that's not super high cost, you know? And uh, I, I came and met you at one of the stops a couple years ago. Now I think it was 20, 2019, maybe. And, uh, uh, it was it was at uh, it was Pheasant Fest, was it not? I, I think it was right around there, but it was uh, it was a little South Dakota brewery. Right. Yeah, it was it, you and Ashley Peters saved me because uh, it was. <laughs> It was a tiny event. I'm like, there's nobody here. And then you got you showed up, and and Ashley showed up, and we had a good time. It was it made it made the night. And they served um, they served a dish uh, inspired by one of your recipes. And I'm trying to remember what it was. It was uh, r rabbit, if I remember. It was like a rabbit pasta, rabbit. Uh... Yeah, it was. Uh, it was just like a. And the rabbit ragu so it was real easy you know they took a bunch of cottontails and ground them up and made a spaghetti sauce out of them and it was really good it was really good I mean, of is that was my recipe so. <laughs> <laughs> of course was and uh did did you do that this time around did they have a did they pair a meal with um they did they did so at fulton they did uh walleye riettes mm. so they smoked a bunch of walleyes and then uh kind of pounded them in with cream cheese and some horseradish and some other things for the, the recipe in the cookbook is for salmon, uh, but, you know, as they as they proved, you can use all kinds of different uh, other fish than, than salmon, which is kind of the point of the book. So I'm glad they did that. Well, we're going to talk about the book, of course, because it is more than than a, a book full of recipes. It is, uh, um, I think April Volke called it a, a handbook in, in, in the book there. And I think that's a, a, a fair description of it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's just set this up because this is a fishing um Handbook. I was going to call it a cookbook. Right. This is a fishing fishing uh, book. Uh, you're known more for hunting, probably, but you grew up fishing more than hunting, right? Right. Exactly. I've been I've been fishing and gathering shellfish and such. Well, probably as long as I can remember, and and before that, I mean, there's pictures of me as a toddler digging clams. You know, where I'm two or three. So, yeah, it's been a whole lifetime, which is which is it's it's nice to actually have a book out that is involved in a subject that I know so much about. You spent a lot of time when you were growing up doing that fishing because you were on the East coast, right? And then you were on yes. boats with people from all over the world. Oh yeah. And <laughs> party boats. So, um, 
unless you live around the Great Lakes, really you don't have party boats in um, in the center of the country because you need big water and lots of people. So there, there are some around Chicago and Milwaukee. But basically it's a boat that everybody gets on, but it's like riding a bus where everyone's going in there to fish. And so anybody and everybody shows up. And if you're friendly and willing to talk to your neighbor, you will learn all kinds of things from people that you might not actually encounter in any other way. I was going to say, we have party boats here in Minnesota, but it's something completely different. I think there was one. Oh, yeah, the Tonka. The Tonka Tonka boat. boat. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, You also, so you learned a lot from all those people, and you got fairly confident in, in your abilities, and you actually placed a bet with a bartender? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, to be in your early 20s or mid 20s, I guess <laughs> I was for this one. So, you know, I used to hang out at an Irish bar called Cavanaugh's in Bayport, Long Island. And this has got to be 96, maybe 95 even. So, yeah, it's like totally mid 20s. And so I came in at the bar and I'm like, hey, man, I bet you every single time I go out fishing this year, I'm going to come home with something. And I'm talking all kinds of smack. And the bartender's like, all right put your money where your mouth is. So he said, all right, so you have to come in the bar immediately after fishing every single time you go. No, it's not like I had to go every single day, but because I had, I actually had a job, but I lived in, you know, it's called Bayport. So you're right on the water. And so I fished probably four days a week, three days, three to four days a week for God months. So he said, all right, so it was like Marchish. And he's like, all right, if you succeed in doing this and you come back and you got to bring us and show us your catch and you got to show us that you're going to eat it till Thanksgiving, you can drink beer for a month for free. But if you fail, you've got to pay the bar tab for the whole bar for a night. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, again, I'm in my mid twenties. It's not like I make a much, a lot of money. So it's like the prospect of financial ruin will sharpen the mind. Uh, so, but what that taught me is that taught me to be flexible. It taught me to really, really pay attention because uh, so many people think that fishing is just, you know, a rod and a reel. And then the next level is a rod and a reel and well, what bait or what lure do you use? Well, it's way more than that. It's where do you go? What time do you go? What are the tides? You know, what are the moon phases? What's the season? You know, what are your best opportunities to succeed on any given day? And that really makes you a, a, a fisherman as opposed to just a person with a rod and a reel in their hand. Did you have to eat your bait one time? I did indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I did indeed. <clears throat> I was using, um, I was using white bait. So like these really tiny little minnows and cause I was actually trying to catch puffer fish, um, because we have an Atlantic puffer fish that unlike the Japanese one, which can kill you, yeah. uh, this one is absolutely delicious. It's it, you, just, you eat the tails. And so it's like, it's almost like a chicken wing where it's like one bone and then you can eat it hmm. and they're fantastic. And I was catching them all week, but I was using these little shiners and no puffer fish. So I'm like, <laughs> All right, we're going to flour them and fry them and have fries with eyes. <laughs> oh, well, well, I was going to ask you about puffer fish next, actually. That was literally the next question on my list here. Really? Because, Are you serious? Yeah, because <laughs> you think about that and immediately you think of, man, if you don't cook it right, you, you're going to be in trouble. But this is a completely different puffer fish. Well, I mean, they do have the, the poisonous liver. So the one in the Pacific, their liver is so toxic that if you get even like a smidge you could in theory die. Uh, and like one or two people in Japan die every year from it. But in the U S so it, this fish lives from about Connecticut down to like Georgia pretty much. And I'll put it this way. I caught 27 of them one day. Uh, and after eating about a dozen, my lips got numb. And so I'm like, (laughs) time to stop eating for today. (laughs) Wow. Uh, you spent some time uh, fishing and eating eels. Oh, I love eels. I love, love, love eels. I mean, we're talking American eels. All right. Yeah. There's, there's just, I mean, they're fantastic. I mean, it's so if you've ever been to a sushi place, you've eaten unagi, right? Sure. It's the barbecued eel. It's rich, white, fatty, just firm. Like it, it's like the Goldilocks fish. It's crazy. And, But when you catch them, there's two things that you need to know. Number one, do not ever, 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 ever net them. 
mm-hmm. unless you want to buy a new net because they what they do is they're a they're slimy and b they get kind of like they go like in the net and then they, they completely like destroy the net with slime and then they get tied up and then you have to cut them out of the net it's just not not a good idea ask me how i know uh <laughs> and two you've gone to a few nets uh just one just one just that's one all it like, takes. Yep. Uh, yeah no that's that's thirty dollars down the grain mm-hmm. and this is in like 1996 so like yeah not no and you the were, other one you were is, saving up to have to pay for an entire bar's worth of drinks at this point so well this is a different <laughs> year but but yeah the uh <laughs> I was, I was a newspaper reporter and we, you know, we didn't make any money. So the other one is uh, they don't die kind of ever. And <laughs> so the, I, this is a trick I learned from an old timer, um, old black guy who used to, he taught me a lot about catching eels because he loved them too. And it, we were fishing on the Rappahannock river in Virginia. And so he's like, what you got to do is you got to go to the supermarket and buy a five pound thing of, of salt, you know, like a thing of Morton's kosher salt and put that in the bottom of a bucket. And when you catch an eel, throw him in the bucket and then he'll squirm around and squirm around and then he'll cover, he'll cover himself with salt and he'll die. And it takes all the slime off. So like you can, you can get through a limit of eels on a five pound or, you know, it's, I think it's a five pound box of, of, of salt. And then they come out of the salt and they're, A, they're salted and B, they're not slimy. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what yep this guy what method is you know what is that salt doing is it drying drying it out or what's how is the salt killing it or is it just because it's out of water or what's i no it's definitely not because it's out of water because those eels can live for months that's a that's an exaggeration but these the eels can live for like a day out of water if they're kept moist so what i think the salt does is it strips their slime layer off and it gives them an overdose of salt now they're anadromous or catadromous is actually really what they are because they they spend their lives in freshwater and then go to salt water to breed, uh, unlike salmon, which do the opposite. And so they, they can handle salt at some point in their life, but not that much. It would be like, you know, kind of over de- ODing on tequila. So this book, let's talk about the book, Hook, Line, and Supper. Uh, obviously, you've got recipes in here. People are going to learn how to cook mm-hmm. different dishes and things like that. But there's so much about techniques and processing um, you know, cooking fish or wild game for a lot of people can be intimidating. And that's probably why a lot of people don't do it. More and more people are starting to do it now. Uh, but this book essentially is not only to give you some recipe ideas and inspire some dishes, but just to teach you how to, how to, what to do with these fish from start to finish. Right? Yeah. So this book takes over as soon as it comes over the rail. Sure. You know, much like uh, buck, buck, moose, come, as soon as the deer's down, that's where I come in. And, and so I start, you know, I've worked commercially on boats. I've worked as a deckhand on charter boats. And so I know I saw those behind you. <laughs> and and, a couple and so there. basically, yay. <laughs> so basically I've seen, I've kind of seen it all in terms of how people handle fish on the deck and a good meal starts as soon as the fish comes over the rail. And there are a few easy tricks that people just need to, do and remember and you're going to have a better quality fish number one is bleed your fish which it's it's hilarious because you know i was taught to bleed fish by old timers in the 70s when i was a little boy because like it was a thing then and somehow it got out of favor and people look at me crosswise like i was fishing for for salmon and salmon and trout of all things in the, in lake michigan in wisconsin and we were the charter captain. This charter captain was giving us massive stink eye for wanting to bleed salmon and trout. And like, are you high? Like, of course you bleed them because they're the bloodiest fish there is. And the the problem with this is, so, okay, so you bleed fish for a number of reasons. Number one is aesthetics. So when you bleed a fish out, when you fillet it, you don't, your cutting board's not covered in blood, but there's a better reason to do it. The fish stays firmer. The, st- the fish... Uh, is a cleaner tasting fish. It's less fishy tasting and the fish will keep more in the fridge. So in other words, a bled trout will keep, I'm just going to make up a number, uh, five days in the fridge and, and a non bled trout will start to smell after three days. So you have, you have extended shelf life, uh, if you bleed and then get it on ice. And then with, with nervous fish, and I call nervous fish, the fish that, um, live fast and die hard. So trout are definitely one of those for freshwater. Uh, if, 
is really helpful if it's possible. Like if you're on a boat, this is possible. So catch your trout, bleed your trout. And it's, it's as easy as getting a five gallon bucket full of water and then pop both gills and put them head first in the water and you'll bleed out. Take that trout in, in a lull in between catching other trout and gut that fish. Gut that fish on the boat and either use the guts for to catch more fish or toss them overboard and then get that fish on ice. You will notice a shocking difference in quality. Well, then Dan, who's with us, has been bleeding his fish. He bled our walleyes that we were catching last week on our trip. But one thing in your mm-hmm. book I hadn't heard of before is pressure bleeding. Yes. Explain what that so is. Pre- pressure bleeding is, a, is a, an Alaskan trick. So I just learned it fairly recently uh, when I was working as a deckhand in Alaska on a salmon boat. So I actually have a YouTube video of me pressure bleeding uh, that we can link to if you'd like. Uh, And I kind of totally walk through the process. But the short version is when you have a fish, and this is kind of any fish, what we do in the commercial market is we head and gut the fish on the boat. So you remove the head, you gut the fish, you scrape that kidney, that that bloody sort of brown line along the spine. And then we have attached to our hose system a, uh, a, a heavy gauge needle, like a kind of a, a, a marinade injector needle kind of thing. And you set it to run through your water hose, kind of like an old man peeing, right? So like <laughs> not, you know, cow pissing on a rock, uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, just kind of like a meh, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> And what that is enough to do is, is you jam that needle into the main artery of the fish, which is, yeah, there you go, which is right underneath, um, it is right underneath the head. So you'll see it. It's pretty obvious. And, and then you jam that in there. And if you think you've bled your fish, you do that. And, oh my God, so much blood comes out that you never knew even though it was there. And the difference in quality for that is profound. So anybody who's ever caught salmon or trout will know that there's a kind of a salmon smell or a salmon stink that you get when you cook this stuff, uh, especially after freezing it. A pressure bled fish does not have that. Hmm. Look at all that blood coming out. And that fish has been bled. Wow. Yeah, it's you wouldn't expect that much more blood to still be in there. Yeah, it's it. And what that does is it improves shelf life. It also improves the firmness of the fish. And it also um, will keep you from, it won't smell. Like it just will not. I've, I've had year old vacuum sealed salmon that has been pressure bled hmm. that, that has no smell. You had uh, a couple of other things. When you talk about bleeding fish, you have another tool that you like to use and it's called <clears throat> wood shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> explain, yep. explain to people what wood shampoo is. It's a, so like... <laughs> If you've ever been to like bat day at twin stadium, oh, yeah. where it's like, it's like a bat, like about like this big, you know, like maybe a foot, two foot long. It's like a little uh, replica bat. Every angler for a hundred miles is going to go to the stadium on that day because this is the greatest thing in the world to like, you know, take the starch out of the shorts of an angry fish. I've got a couple of those bats from old twins games back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the English call it a priest. Pre interesting. Yeah. I guess I think that's medieval because I think in medieval times that priests and clerics were not allowed to use bladed weapons. So they had a mace to bash your head in instead. (laughs) Wow. Man. (laughs) Well, uh all stuff that we've learned in Hook Line in Supper, again in the book, and it there there's a lot more, obviously, as we've said, a lot more than fish recipes in there, but a lot about the processing, but also just a lot about fish in general and, and learning about different types of fish, the benefits, what you should look out for. And I know, Hank, when I'm fishing, I'm generally happy, uh, but there might be some science behind that. <laughs> the science of, of being happy while fishing. I mean, I think I think it's just every animal and, and this has been proven in, in zoo animals even, is, is happier when you work for your own food. There's a, uh, an experiment that they did with like lions and tigers where when they threw the meat to the lions and tigers, they were like, meh. But if they made them solve problems, they were much happier. And so it's the, the equivalent to that in the fishing world is that trout that you caught when you were in the backcountry 
or in the boundary waters that you ate that day for dinner is the best trout you've ever had mm -hmm, because sure. it's the experience it's the working for it it's it is all of that and the there's got to be some sort of hormone or dopamine or whatever that 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 we get from the meal after a successful either hunt or or fishing trip well and even you've talked break down talking about uh amino acids and omega-3s and uh brain mm -hmm. food and some other big words that uh, i'm not gonna be able to pronounce <laughs> correctly in there um so uh, there is some science about the the health benefits and uh, oh, yeah. just the, the mental benefits of course about it um and then when it comes to when it comes to like the the fishing industry um you touch on who to trust in the fishing industry when it comes to say sustainable practices and healthy fish and i want to use what you described in there as an excuse that i i'm gonna just gonna have to move to alaska that because of this <laughs> Well, you could do worse. Yeah. Um, the, the Alaska Constitution requires that every fishery be sustainable. So a, an enormous amount of that state's resources are spent keeping that promise. So, uh, for example, when we fish salmon in Alaska, our openers are typically three days. So it's, you know, we'll open it on like noon on a Sunday and then it's open all day Monday and usually, usually all day Tuesday and then it closes at noon on Wednesday. Now they can they can shorten that or lengthen it, and it's all dependent on scientists watching how many salmon come up river, and if X amount of salmon come up the river, then they're like, okay, cool, you guys can fish, and if lots of salmon fish, you know, come up the river, they're like, oh, you get an extra day, and if not enough come up, you're like, oh, we have to cut it a day short. So it's it's a constantly moving thing, and it's it's a very supple, very advanced way of managing fisheries that really really no other state does and and uh, you know it's it's kind of amazing so how does that matter from a, a consumer's perspective from a consumer's perspective if you buy american or if you catch it yourself you're pretty much okay now there you there are people who could you know make exceptions to that and sure there you could but it's in general American fisheries are more heavily regulated than those of other countries. So in general, if you want to feel good about that fish that you buy, make sure it's from the United States or you catch it yourself. It's pretty interesting too, how they track and monitor those, that, those river runs for those fish with different sonar techniques and mm -hmm. people out there just counting. <laughs> you know, they, have some, they have bridges sometimes where it's like, a guy's like one, two, three, four. <laughs> Man, uh, be quite a job. But it, it's also interesting and on how it's worked because this is a completely different example to, or a completely different situation to use as, as an example, but here on Mille Lacs now, they've been closing the season in the, the hottest part of the summer because of hook mortality, mm -hmm. and as they're watching that population of fish, and everybody freaks out about it, of course, because it's, it's, it's a huge traditional walleye factory, and it's close to the Twin Cities, so it gets fished by a lot of people, so they don't like it when they close that down, but having that approach of opening and closing, and sure, it gets confusing, um, but maybe that maybe that's going to become more the norm in, in more areas based on what they've done in Alaska up there. I think you're right. Um, I think they do that with trout here in the, in the West too. And we have mm -hmm. really nasty heat waves. There's notices everywhere. Like don't fish for trout or if you fish for trout, fish for trout for like an hour at dawn, because, uh, you know, once the temperature gets up, you get this, you get a really vicious hook mortality, like over 50%. And it, you know, in the case where it might look like a perfect release, but if it's 80 degrees out, mm -hmm. that fish is going to die. Um, just throw, trout. throw one more <laughs> picture up there. Uh, Hank, you're not a fan of tilapia. I am sort of a fan of tilapia. So I'm a fan of tilapia when you catch them in the Gulf of Mexico or Florida where they've gone feral. Because ah. that's a tilapia living its best life. Um, tilapia in the store is the soylent green of fish. It's people. <laughs> you have to be a certain age to get that, Jerry. <laughs> right. um, in the book, you list some of the health concerns when it comes to eating fish and list some of the, some of the fish to avoid for different reasons, um, like uh, high mercury contents. And this one kind of stuck out to me because so, so my mom wasn't, 
she's not really a fish eater. She's not a wild game eater. She, you know, if we shoot a deer, she doesn't eat the venison. If we caught walleye, she, that was, it was the guys having a fish fry out in the garage or at the cabin or, or whatever. But once in a while she'd go to the store and she'd come home with orange roughy. And I remember mm-hmm. eating that every so often as a kid. So, and now it's been many years since I've had it, but you're saying it, they don't, you don't, you haven't seen it in a, in a store for quite a while. I for like forever. Like I, for whatever reason, either fishery collapsed or Americans taste changed or whatever. But yeah, I have not seen orange ruffy in ages. Hmm. I, I obviously haven't been paying attention, but I, I was curious what that, what the cause of that might be, but hmm, that's interesting. Well, know. it's like, I mean, it's like Chilean sea bass. Like there was a run on them. Hmm. And so in the nineties, I think it was where like everybody was serving Chilean sea bass on the menu and, and they really, really overfished them and they're low, they're big, slow growing fish. So now there's only one sustainable fishery for them left and it's the Falkland islands. So if you see Chilean sea bass, it's actually, um, from with a United Kingdom marker. So it's from the United Kingdom. That one's a, that one's a sustainable fishery and funny story the way they keep it sustainable is they, the Royal Navy patrols that fishery. And if, if pirates, you know, pirate anglers or pirate commercial fishermen go in there and try and catch them, they will put a shot across their bow. Really? It's like, they're, they're, that's no joke. <laughs> I love a good pirate story. I didn't right? expect one today. <laughs> that's great. Arr, arr, arr. Um, but <laughs> When it comes to that, like buying fish at the store, you also list a bunch of tips that kind of break down what to look for when you buy fish at the store in the book. Yeah, I think the number one thing for most people listening to this would be unless you have access to a really good fish market, like, like, you'll know, you know, you'll know. It's be, be that fish market everybody talks about. Unless you have one of those in your community, just go right to the freezer section. Just skip the, fe- the the so-called fresh fish aisle altogether because virtually all of that fish is going to be uh, thawed already. So you'll see little teeny, teeny, teeny sign that says previously frozen. And it means that they bought it fresh or they bought it they bought it frozen. They thawed it in their cooler and you don't know how many days it's been there. And, and you will get better quality fish and seafood if you buy it frozen because it's been properly frozen by the manufacturer. So it's either FAS, which is frozen at sea, or it's frozen, blast frozen, like blast frozen at a, at a processing plant on shore. So why does that matter? Blast freezing at 40 below zero or colder. When something freezes, as you, as you well know, that ice is bigger than water. So when something freezes, it expands and the faster that you freeze something, the smaller those ice crystals form within the thing, in this case, a piece of fish. So if you have a piece of fish that is blast frozen at 40 below or, or colder, the ice crystals that form are very, very small, and you're going to have very minimal moisture loss when you thaw it out. So that blood, when you thaw a piece of venison or that mm-hmm. liquid, when you thaw a piece of walleye, that's cell wall fluid. Yeah, there you go. That cell wall fluid that um, is inevitable when you're thawing, but it is way worse than if you froze something in your kitchen freezer versus a, a piece of blast frozen seafood. And so it, it even actually works in the sense that it's been blast frozen in Texas or Alaska or wherever, but it's at your regular freezer temperature. It's still fine because its initial freezing process was very, very cold. Um, we're, most of this audience is probably in the Midwest and our idea of fresh fish at the store is probably a little bit different than fresh fish on the coast, isn't it? Well, I mean, there are really good commercial fisheries for freshwater fish in Minnesota or, or available to Minnesotans is probably a better way to put it. Um, you get Canadian walleye, you Mm, get yellow perch, you get things from the great lakes, um, there are commercial freshwater fisheries. And so you have the opportunity to get really high quality freshwater um, fish, you know, at a, at a market. Whereas that's not possible where I live, but I can get really good saltwater fish. When it comes to actually doing your own fish, though, going out and catching it, bringing it home, cutting it up, we've talked about 
what to do ble bleeding the fish, what to do right away. But now that you got them home, what tools do you recommend people having in their, their arsenal at home? I think number one, it would be a fish spatula. So it's a bendy, um, very light, very thin spatula that's handed. So I'm left handed. So because the really? world hates me, I had to specially <laughs> order one. Uh, a a left-handed fish spatula. So now we've talked about right. pirates and uh, priests and uh, wood shampoo and now left-handed <laughs> spatulas on the show today. Yep. And so a fish spatula has a little blade on the end of it. And it's not a very sharp blade, but it's sharp enough. And you want that flexibility and that thinness and that little bit of cutting power so that if a piece of fish wants to, if, if a piece of a piece of fish wants to stick on your grill or your pan, that's the tool to get it off. Whereas if you have a thicker spatula, it's just not going to work. So that, that, that would be number one. Yep. That would be the right handers version. And the, another really important thing would be things that you, Oh, you know what, you know what I've started to use over the last four or five years that, that, really helps with your searing a piece of fish is a bacon press. So if you have a piece of fish, right, and you're searing it, if its skin is on, it's going to want to arc. And so a bacon press flattens it out. Interesting. And, and so by doing that, you have perfect connection with, you can do this with, with a duck breast too, by the way. Um, it prevents it from arcing up. Oh. And so you get a flat piece and a better sear. That happens. And so I use that skin. all the time. You can use a pan, a little pan if you wanted to, but a bacon press works perfect. Interesting. Hmm. You also talk about using a spoon. So I've, I've heard of a couple of different yeah. methods of cleaning a northern pike, and uh, you actually talk about a couple of the popular methods in the book too. But you then brought up a spoon, which I, I'd never heard of using a spoon when you're, when you're cleaning pike. Oh, the spoon meat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I, I originally learned about this with salmon because the cool thing about a salmon is that virtually all of it's edible. Like you can do something with everything. I mean, people even eat the livers. Um, I find the livers to be heavily parasitized, so I don't really mess with them. But um, other than the guts and gills, there's a use for pretty much everything. So after you've filleted any fish, unless you're Jedi master, and I'm pretty good but I'm not a Jedi master. Uh, there's going to be some meat left on those, on that carcass. So you take a spoon and you, and you just scrape back from the head or where the head was back towards the tail. And you will pull off an enormous amount of meat that is perfect for like fish cakes, fritters, um, meatballs. Uh, like if you wanted to, if for some reason you want to make a fish, like a ground fish, preparation like a i've got a recipe for fish sausage in the book um but the spoon meat is my number one thing to use for um fish cakes and so pike cakes made with that spoon meat especially if you get a big one like i was fishing in canada a couple of years ago and i caught a 41 incher and that's a lot of pike mm -hmm. so i didn't want to waste any of the meat uh you got to explain fish sausage now i, I don't think we can go any further without you talking about what your fish sausage is like. So fish sausage, um, it's, it took me a lot of iterations to get one where I actually wanted to eat it. Um, and it's, it's kind of not unlike what they do in the UP where you want at the very least 50% of your fish to be made with a fatty fish, which in your neck of the woods is lake trout or other trout because your only fatty fish that you have, with any consistency because sheep's head do get fat sometimes, but they could be also lean. They, they kind of go through cycles, but, but the salmonids, so the lake trout, whitefish, um, lake trout, whitefish and other kinds of trout, they're always going to be fatty. So that's kind of what you want to make your fish sausage out of. But even then it needs some more fat. And I've seen people use oil. I like to use cream, you know, heavy cream, full heavy cream. Don't mess around full heavy cream. Cause it's the fat you want. And then you basically just grind it, you know, you make it just like any other sausage. And then instead of ice water, you put really cold heavy cream and then that's your bind and that's your mixture. And then my advice, if you're going to do that is to, uh, is to stuff it into sheep casings 
Hmm. So the really narrow ones that don't have a lot of uh, bite to them, you could use narrow pork casings too. So like you can buy pork casings from places like the sausage maker uh, and you can buy, you know, they come in different widths. So you're going to want the most narrow because they're going to be the, the most tender in terms of a casing because you want to, you want to case your sausage exactly like you do any other sausage. And then in my opinion, fish sausages are best smoked. Okay. So you then smoke it and then you, then you can even, you can just eat it as is, or you can reheat it and there it's, it's pretty good. Is it, is it become like a, like, you know, um, like something that you would eat as a snack or like a, like a, like a brat or you'd be putting it on Either your way. plate and cutting into her. Okay. Either way. I mean, I've eaten them, I've eaten them cool out of the refrigerator with mustard while watching the Packers go Packers. Um, <laughs> you're probably a Vikings fan. Yeah, we're going to have to end this interview now. Nah, <laughs> it's all right. Sure. Well, that, um, that's interesting. What, and then what, not to give away your whole recipe on here, but what, what kind of seasonings will you, what kind of taste will you try to get out of that? Because, um, I come at it from a Northern tradition. So like a Great Lakes kind of tradition, I use things like mustard seed and marjoram and horseradish. Um, I don't, I don't make it like, it's not like a chorizo. Like that's not to say that you couldn't do a chorizo, but that would be a different kind of fish sausage. Uh, and I probably would do that with something like a, like a King mackerel, you know, so like a tropical fish, but up there with lake trout and whitefish, I would definitely kind of think brought. Hmm. Sure. Well, that sounds good. Um, you know, that, that's a beauty. I think when you, when you look through a book like this, when you read a book like this, it just gives you, it just opens up your, your brain to new possibilities, especially if you've cooked walleye a million times, it just gives you some new (laughs) ideas, you know, some new, new things to try and new ways to do things. And and in fact, I was reading about, uh, we were talking about trout. I was reading about, um, how you fillet a trout or process, say a rainbow trout. And I, a lot of times too, I will cut them open and I'll, you know, I'll just kind of gut them basically. And then usually what I end up doing is putting some butter and some seasoning inside that, that cavity that I've created and I'll cook it right on the grill. A lot of times mm-hmm. I'll cut the head off or something when I do that, but just leave the rest of it kind of all intact. And then after I cook it, um, sometimes I'll grab that backbone and pull the ribs out and pull it out after it's been cooked. But you actually talk about doing that before you cook it and mm-hmm. you cut that dorsal fin off. And then the best part about it though, is you sew it afterwards. You stuff it and sew it. You can, I mean, it's stuffing and sewing is a little bit, I mean, I'll do that for like Thanksgiving. Like, so there's a traditional striped bass Thanksgiving dinner for coastal New England where they don't use a turkey, they use a striped bass. So they do that. I will admit that I do not always sew it. (laughs) But what I do often is uh, you'll you'll either kite it. So to kite a fish is to uh, not gut it and fillet down around the ribs and so that the belly is in one piece and you, of course, remove the guts. So that's kiting. And then butterflying is the opposite. So butterflying is you gut the fish and then you you remove the bones so that the the back of the fish is intact. So it's it's two avenues to the same street basically. And there you go. So so kiting would be the opposite. So you see the collars, and that is uh, so all those bones are out. And it, you know to, to kite I, I kite like um, codfish when I'm doing salted cod. And I've, I've kited, um, lake trout when I'm going to smoke a whole lake trout, but this process really is cool with like littler trout is in that you can serve it as like a big flat thing. And there's a Mexican dish called, um, uh, uh, pescado zarandeado. And that's where they flatten the fish just like that. And then they, they put it in a fish basket on the grill and one side has green salsa and one side has red salsa on it. It's super cool. It's a really neat dish. Hmm. Well, and obviously this stuff is in the book. You have a lot on mm-hmm. your website as well. Um, tell people where we can where, where we can find you online and on social media. So I'm probably most active on social media on Instagram. So I'm at Hunt Gather Cook on Instagram, and that's I like that venue because it still seems like the way social media used to be, which is to say, let's have some fun, show some cool pictures, and like not hate each other and yeah, for sure so for the most part so for the most part instagram has been fun um and that's hunt gather cook and then on facebook i run a private group called hunt gather cook and 
it is it's I got almost 24,000 members in it and it's it's private so you have to answer questions to get in just tell uh, tell me that uh, you heard me on this podcast or this radio show and I'll let you in but the thing is the reason we do that is because I try to keep ah uh, you know I mean riffraff's not a good word but there, there are some people who are just not there for the right reasons I mean sure. that we have everything from like hippie earth mothers who are vegetarians on there to like dually driving MAGA people And everybody gets along because I there's no politics involved yeah. policy. Like keep it keep it. It's all about being better at wild food. So you, the whole point is for everyone to hey, I got a question about this, and I want to be better at doing this. Whatever this is, as long as it's a wild food topic, um, it's valid. And and it's been good. It's been really good. Like I only have to swing the band hammer like once a month, which is pretty good for the twenty four thousand. That is pretty good, and especially in today's climate. I mean, right? <laughs> people have to just get politics out of their brain for so many. Mm -hmm. for, you, you can only think about it for so much, and and it seems like it creeps into every aspect of people's lives, especially on social media, because people feel as though there's no repercussions for what they say on there. So it's nice when people from all sorts of backgrounds, all yep. sorts of political uh, affiliations, ideologies and whatever, and can just talk about food or hunting mm -hmm. and fishing yep. and, and getting outside. We're all there for all there for the, I'm here for the food. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, Hank. And where can people get the book? You can buy the book literally wherever fine books are sold. Um, so my best advice would be if you need it now like asap i would actually go to amazon because i cannot match their shipping they're they're really amazon's more of a shipping company than anything else sure however um you help me out a little bit more if you buy it direct from me so there's the link there um i can't it's going to take you four to five maybe six days to get it because i have to sell it um i have to ship it media mail but if you're willing to wait a couple of days uh buy from me Uh, or buy from your local bookstore, they can get it too. Uh, or then uh, if you need it ASAP, go to Amazon uh, either way. So there's lots of different ways to get it depending on what your needs are. And I got I to gotta reorder pheasant, quail, cottontail, I think. Either that or I put it in a different bookcase because I've, I've got it and I've used it a lot, but I think I let... You mean the one that you just picked up about 10 minutes ago? No, I've got... Oh, yeah. No, what's the other one? I'm missing duck, one duck, of goose. them. Duck, duck, You're missing goose. missing duck, duck, goose. And I think... I can't remember if I let it... I may have let an ex-girlfriend borrow it. I'm pretty sure you did. And I don't think I ever got it back. So that's the one. Uh, I'll have so to that, that one, one you right. should get on Amazon or from your local bookstore because I don't sell that one directly on my site. Okay. So the, the Duck and Goose Cookbook is probably, I mean, in, I would say your best bet is Amazon in that case. Sure. And, I, you know, I use Amazon plenty and... Uh, Uh, I've got no qualms about using Amazon, but I'll tell you what, I'm always a proponent of, of buying local and, and especially somebody like you that this is, this is your product. You put the work, I'd like you to yep. get the benefits out of it. So I encourage definitely people definitely helps me out a little bit more. I encourage people to buy it from your site. Uh, Hank, uh, great stuff. Keep up the good work out there. Um, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show today. And, uh, hopefully, hopefully the rest, if you've got more, of the, do you have more of the book tour coming up? I hope so. I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah, like I, 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 I want to go to Alaska. I want to go to the mid, upper Midwest, New England, the deep south again. Like I got a lot of places that I want to go. And, you know, let's cross your fingers that um, that the world conditions are going to going to let me do my thing. Yeah, do you have, I mean, do you have dates or is everything kind of on hold yeah. again for you? Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, everything you just, you just show the book tour page oh, on Hunter on Angler Gardener oh, Cook. Sorry. And cut it off short. that page shows you what's, what's absolutely nailed down. Now, who knows, you know, you know, pandemic crap yeah. willing. Uh, but this is what I'm planning on doing. And then uh, beyond September and October, uh, I am planning to be in the South um, and a little bit more in the, in the Northeast in October, November. So, I'm um, doing my best and, you know, hopefully we can make it happen. Yeah. Well, good luck with everything. Uh, people thanks. can find everything that you got going on on your website there. And of course, on social media, uh, Hank Shaw, thanks for the time today on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Hear more at sportingjournalradio.com or wherever you get podcasts. 
Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Hay Bale Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Hay Bale Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today.